Good morning, everyone. My name is Julia Chatillo, and I am the Programming Director for South by Southwest EDU. On behalf of our entire team, welcome to day three of this year's event. It has been such a joy to welcome this incredible community back to Austin, and we hope that you're ready for another exciting day celebrating the powerful work happening in education around the world. Later today, don't miss the latest innovations showcased in this year's launch in student startup competitions, and don't forget to please check out the last day of the expo. Now, to kick off the day, it is my sincere honor to introduce this morning's keynote conversation. This year, we're celebrating being together again as a community in person for the first time in three years, all while still grappling with the impact and effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on our lives. As we look ahead to reimagining what our education systems look like after this period of profound change, one of our biggest priorities lies in placing students at the center of our efforts to rebuild and recover. At South by Southwest EDU Online 2021, we had the privilege of welcoming Secretary Cardona and the team from a starting point to share their visions and goals for the future of education. And it is an absolute pleasure to be able to welcome them in person in Austin this year in conversation with local students on the importance of uplifting student voices for that future. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dana Brown, Chief Content Officer at A Starting Point, and the United States Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona. Hello, Austin. How's everybody? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to welcome the Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, right Good here. morning, good uh, morning. Return. Uh, I, you know, I, I could sit here and read his biography and we'd be here for about half an hour. Um, so I'm just gonna skip kind of ahead. Uh, let's see, began his career as a fourth grade teacher, becoming the youngest principal in the history of the state of Connecticut at 27. Uh, Connecticut Commissioner of Education, uh, of, of course, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. I'm a dad and I'm a teacher. Yeah. There you go. Uh, you know, but before we get into it with the secretary, uh, we have a special video from a few of my colleagues who unfortunately couldn't be here uh, to travel. So let's, let's hit that and then we'll get going. Hello, Austin. Chris Evans here. We're so sorry we couldn't be down there with you and Secretary Cardonia in person at South by Southwest EDU. In March of 2020, Mark and I were supposed to launch a starting point at South by Southwest. Now, of course, that was right at the moment that the pandemic came along, and well, you all know what happened next. So here we are, finally, a couple years older and hopefully wiser. We went on to launch ASP, a nonpartisan civic engagement platform, a few months later. And now, more than a year and a half later, our idea has been fully realized and still growing. Please check us out online at astartingpoint.com, or you can download the app. At ASP, we are very passionate about the education system, and over the past year and a half, we have focused on a lot of issues surrounding the challenges facing schools or students and teachers alike, especially as the pandemic has complicated schooling and education. And I personally feel that now more than ever, it is critical that we feel and be engaged, not just within our government, but with each other. And so to that end, we have partnered with the Close-Up Foundation and Bridge USA, two civic engagement organizations working with high school and college students across the country. So we'll jump at any chance to talk about education in America, and we are excited that ASP is joining U.S. Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, and a few students today to talk about just that. Now, since we couldn't be there in person, we wanted to kick things off with a question for the Secretary, and then we'll turn it over to you guys to get into it. Secretary Cardona, what's the most important lesson you've learned about education in America during your first year on the job? All right, we'll leave you to it. Have a great conversation. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. They'll hear it someday. <laughs> um, so most important lesson, it just reaffirmed, man, this is a relationship business. Uh, this is a people business. And uh, schools are hubs of community. I've traveled 27 states. And um, in the conversations that I have with students, what I hear from them is, Schools are like my second family. The people there are like my second family. So that's why we were pushing so hard to safely reopen our schools. Schools are hubs of the community. It's all about relationships. Um, that to me was what was reaffirmed during this pandemic. Yeah. So you, you were 
running the Education Department of Connecticut when the pandemic hit. Right. You are now running the federal government. So you've, you've experienced quite a bit in, yeah, <laughs> in, yeah. in the past couple of years. You know, I saw a quote of yours recently where you said that there's now a chance for a reset in education after the pandemic. So let's, let's get specific. Tell me, sure. tell me about that vision. What does that mean? Sure. You know, I've been in education my whole career. Um, and one of the things that really drew me to education was the ability to address disparities that exist across our country. We've become almost uh, desensitized or we've normalized how uh, there are gaps in opportunity and achievement in our students based on place and race. Uh, and I really felt like whatever I do, I want to address that. So before the pandemic, that was a really big focus. Then the pandemic hits and it's made worse. Access to food, access to technology, access to in-person learning uh, perpetuated and made worse those gaps that existed before. So my mentality is we had such a significant disruption in education. We need to proportionately disrupt the systems that were there before that led to those data. So I, I call it a reset. We're closer to a reset in education than ever before. We've already been disrupted. So why are we building it back the way it was when it didn't work for everyone? So for me, you know, and I'm gonna be very frank and honest, I know there are educators in the room that have fought for the last two years to do everything and so much is put on our educators. They need a chance to breathe as well and be supported and, and we're, hopefully we can get to that in the conversation around what we need to do to support our educators. But I, I want there to be like a renaissance of, of innovation uh, using the American Rescue Plan funds, but using the urgency that we have as educators, as parents, as um, education advocates, to really rethink what it means to provide a well-rounded education for our students in America. There are a lot of teachers in this room, obviously, and they, they've lived through this last two years. Yeah. And, you know, by the way, round of applause for all you teachers and everything you've gone through. Um, it's, it's been incredibly difficult, but you know, there's, there's a real issue with teacher shortages right now. I mean, we were, I was just having a conversation with someone uh, ab about the military having to come in and, right. and fill in in New Mexico, uh, oh, the National Guard. Is there anything the federal government can do to attract more teachers or to attract a new generation of teachers and educators? Well, first of all, I'm happy you got substitutes so you could be here. Uh, <laughs> I know how hard that is. Um, <laughs> shout out to the substitutes that are covering. Um, look. Well, you know what we can do? We can start respecting our educators uh, nationally. We, we could start by, by honoring them and not passing legislation that undermines our educators and our education system, right? We, we need to make sure that we're lifting up the profession. We are doing a lot of things. Uh, we've been very bold with the American Rescue Plan to talk about increasing teacher pay. Teachers should not have to work two to three jobs to make ends meet. Not, they shouldn't have done it before, definitely not now. But it's more than pay. When I talk to teachers, I hear from them, listen, I just need working conditions that uh, promote my professional growth, that understands uh, the complexity of teaching. You know, we have teachers spending a lot of their own personal time doing work-related stuff, and we've normalized that. Teachers also need to have voice in the conversation. As we reimagine our schools and rebuild our schools, they need to have a seat at the table if we really uh, are serious about honoring the profession, right? So those are some things. The Biden-Harris administration from day one with the ARP funds have really pushed uh, teacher development, teacher support, but also in our budget. I think it's really important and often gets overlooked that any proposal that the president put forward includes teacher uh, pipeline programs, making sure that our uh, educator workforce is more diverse than ever before, and there's real money connected to that. I was in Tennessee recently and I saw a program. I walked into a high school, um, class and there were students in there, all of them were connecting to be a teacher. And the, the, the teacher of that class was probably the happiest teacher I've seen in, in, in a year. Uh, she said, these are gonna be teachers soon. And they were connected to the university. So when they left that high school, they were gonna go to the university, they were gonna get financial support, hopefully with the American Rescue Plan, to continue their degrees and then go back into the school. So we need to think outside of the box. This is our moment. We need to have our teachers at the table when we make these decisions so that it can be sustainable. You know, I, I have to raise this, you know, 
uh, and I know there have been some other panels on this, and a lot of people are talking about this, but it seems, it seems the culture wars have, have come to education, and we're seeing yeah. a lot of laws uh, being passed at the state level, most recently in Florida. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, we only have an hour, and I want to make sure I hear from students, but <laughs> look, one thing we've learned in the last couple months across the world, nobody likes a bully. Nobody likes a bully. And especially when bullying has happened to those who are most in need, are, are, are most fragile, or are most underserved, are most marginalized students. No one likes a bully. Um, we're going to support our students. We're going to stand behind our students. And, you know, I've talked to many parents who said, that doesn't represent what I think. So don't, please don't disguise it as a parent's bill. It, it's really about <laughs> protecting our most vulnerable students standing behind them, and I want to say loud and clear, we're going to stand behind them 100%. And we're going to also protect their civil rights. So if there's uh, a violation of civil rights, we're going to get involved. Um, we need to support our students. We need to make sure that they have more support, not less, as we reopen our schools. Yeah. Uh, so, so this panel, putting students' voices first. Um, and before we, we bring out our students, who are so impressive, we were yeah. chatting with them behind. They're just great, great kids. So really excited to get them out here. But when it comes to putting students' voices first, what kind of insights do you think students are uniquely qualified to provide when it comes to our education system? Tell, what, tell me what it is about students' voices that you think is so important to listen to. We serve them. And I think part of this reimagining, we really need to shift it and say, how do we better serve them? They're the experts in what they need. And I'm not just talking about the content. I'm talking about the uh, mental health supports or the uh, social emotional connections that they need, they have to have a seat at the table. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, our students, I mean, what I heard from them is schools are, like I said, my second home. So we need to make sure that we're providing those environments that meet their needs. Because when those needs are being met, their ability, to, their bandwidth for learning exponentially increases. So those days of structuring our schools where student voice was marginalized has to be behind us. As we reopen, as we reimagine, Think about how we're engaging our student voice in a sustainable way, in a real way, not a fake kind of like it looks good every once in a while to have an assembly and hear from students. How are students' voice driving the improvement work of a school? Uh, I think that's the question we have to ask as we move forward in education. Let's do it. Let's bring them let's in. Bring, let's bring them out. Let's bring them on out. <laughs> hey, guys. Sin miedo, sin miedo. Um, do you guys need microphones or do you have like? Uh, There's some behind you. Why don't we just why don't we start with you and and go around and just tell us who you are, what you're studying, what what grade you're in, and all that. So my name is Jesenia Alvarez. I attend Travis High School and I graduate this spring. <laughs> so. <laughs> I plan on attending the University of Texas, majoring in architectural engineering. Nice. Hi, my name is Audra Garcia. I'm a junior at the University of Texas at Austin, where I'm double majoring in English and government. Awesome. Uh, hi, my name is John Mark Hunter. I currently attend Austin Community College at Highland, studying art and animation. Before we get into it, Secretary, is there anything you want, you want to tell these, these great students before we jump into it? We were talking in the back. There's a big Beatles fan, this guy here. <laughs> Jay Balbin and Bad Bunny, and we were talking, you're going to go see The weekend. These are some really cool kids. She has a math test today, so she's a little, but we're going to write her a little note to see if we can push it back a, a little bit. These are some great students. What's great is Jesenia, I think, called us the other day and said, I can't do it. I have a math test. <laughs> and, and we said, don't worry about it. We'll deal with it. We'll, we'll, take, we'll take care of it. Any math teachers here? Yeah. All right, we can, we can give her a hand. Yeah. Someone give her a note and so we can get her out of this. Um, so Jesenia, I'll, I'll start with you. I mean, what was the pandemic and remote learning like for you and your classmates? Um, it was difficult. <laughs> I think that's the simplest way to put it. But for me, it was a big transition going from in school and the beginning of, I want to say freshman year, the beginning of sophomore year was not really challenging. But 
shifting onto <laughs> shifting into online learning and doing everything virtual was difficult because it felt like the resources that I did have, the teachers that I had when I was in person was kind of like cut from me. So whenever I had questions or anything, it was hard to even ask because even on Zoom, everyone had their cameras off and the teacher was the only one there. And it was just hard to understand the material, which when you're taking ACC classes and UT courses, it's very difficult when you don't have an instructor by your side helping you whenever you really do need the help. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult. And, and Audrey, you, I mean, you finished high school and started college during all of this. So what was that experience like? It was very difficult for me and my friends as well, just because we barely got our footing in, in college and then we're barely getting used to the college classes and right away it's the pandemic. So once we go home, like it, we didn't have the study rooms and coming from like Mexican households, there was a lot of noise that we couldn't like study. <laughs> so <laughs> it was very hard when you can hear your father like banging the pots and you're trying to hear your class. So we couldn't really like focus on our studies. There was no motivation to do it. I mean, we obviously did. We tried to keep like our spirits up. We'd all have like little Zoom meetings with our friends to like, mm -hmm. you got this, <laughs> but it was very hard for us. And John Mark, you, you had a similar experience. I mean, you finished high school and started college. I mean, what was that process like for you? Yeah, it was weird because I was sort of in a transitioning period because I was doing dual credit at the time and it was a transition between graduating high school and starting into college. And so I was sort of like getting used to college while finishing out my years of high school during the middle of a pandemic. And like at first mentally, it didn't seem like it was a big deal because a lot of my life I've spent like in my room on my computer because that's what art and animation is. You're just at a computer all the time. And I'm like, okay, this transition will be easy. But the difference between doing that with like something of that stature and then something like education where it's more helpful when you're having someone in your corner, someone in that environment to help you, it's like a drastic change. And then add that along with like transitioning to like one of the higher forms of education where you start to lose the assistance you have. It's just sort of, it's weird for your mental state uh, and you don't exactly know what you're doing in that situation. Uh, and especially since, like I said, I'm work, you'd be working from home and going to school from home at the same time. Uh, and then especially like, cause in my household, everyone was either at school or at work via the internet. And so like my dad would be taking a meeting in the bedroom, which means my mom would have to move to the living room and no one could bother my sister cause she was doing school in her bedroom. And so it was just sort of like everyone in one environment at the same time. And like with a family like that, you want to wring each other's necks because it's frustrating. <laughs> but the thing is like, it's a frustrating experience that you're going through together. And so like at the same time, like you're really frustrated with what's happening. You're also like, you know that you're not alone in the situation. I think that helps a lot. I, I was talking to your mother backstage who was a teacher and I'm going to come back to that. Yeah. Secretary, I mean, you have, two children in high school, so, so uh, you know, with running Connecticut and then yeah. the U.S. government. What was it like for you? I mean, what was it like for you watching your kids go through this? Yeah, my daughter was in eighth grade, and uh, she transitioned, you know, during the pandemic. My son was a sophomore. He's a senior now. I can tell you from the social-emotional perspective, what a difference it was. As, as John Mark said at the beginning, it was kind of novel. It was different. But then they lacked the relate, you know, think about how students develop. Uh, social, social interaction is such a big part of it. And uh, I saw that they were longing for that. So when school came back in person, I saw such, a, such an improvement in that. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes we skip that. We focus on what, we're, what the challenges were, but the improvement in emotional well-being when schools got back in is something that I noticed as a father they were happy again, they were connecting with their friends, and it was just like, ah, oh, they're back. Uh, but what, during that period, I saw a shift. Um, you lose motivation, you know, it's hard when you don't have that social interaction or they miss hanging out and roasting each other in the cafeteria or in the hallways. What students do in high school, um, they miss that. So to see them improve when they got back in was a joy as a parent. It, and that's an interesting point you raise about the social aspect in school and how important that is to the development, especially at that age in high school. 
does any I'll start with you. I mean, how did you stay connected to, to friends? You know, I remember there were points where we were really stuck in our houses. Right. We couldn't see people. How did you stay connected to friends and classmates, and how important was that? So pre-COVID, um, I would be very involved in school. I still am, but it was a lot easier before COVID. And I would do debate team, and mm -hmm. I would do a sport. I do softball. Um, but during the pandemic, it was just really helpful to have a teacher that cared enough to still have the debate weekly meetings. And even after our virtual classes ended, he would open his Zoom and we would just pop in. And it's just the consistency that I had pre, during, and after COVID of being able to still talk to the debate team people and still like have that connection with that teacher um, was really me meaningful because it just, it was the one thing that was consistent and I can rely on when all my classes were really difficult. And like you said, like my dog was barking, my, my niece was crying. It was really hard to do everything um, while I was in school. So the consistency of like social clubs like that, even if it was through Zoom, was very helpful. What, and what about for you, Audrey? Uh, I have like the same experience. I was lucky enough to have two clubs. I'd still try to keep like the interaction going. Uh, it was a bit hard. I mean, our numbers did drop drastically. We had like 50 and then we went down to 10 members on Zoom and it's like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so there wasn't that much interaction. So I will say that I w didn't get to keep like the classmates I had like made as friends. I just have like my inner circle and I kind of stayed with those people because I didn't get to interact with anyone else that I met prior. Mm. What about you, Jamar? Right. Uh, for me, the situation was a little bit different because as COVID was ramping up, uh, a lot of my friends and their families decided to move back to where they, because they had moved from different places to Austin for different reasons. And so as things were ramping up, they started moving back, you know, as a means of safety, especially since Austin, like, has so many people. So it's obviously, you'd want to be conscious of, like, the amount of people you're around in an environment like that. Uh, so a lot of my relationships weren't as physical and in person uh, as they were before. Uh, but that also allowed me to start connecting with those same people uh, via like different forms of the internet, as well as meeting new people by those same means. Like during the pandemic, I met a bunch of people through like Discord servers and things of that nature. Uh, and not only were we just we not only did we have like a bunch of things in common, but we also had the unifying factor of this is how the pandemic is affecting us, and that is like a unifying factor that brings us together. And so it's obviously like a frustrating time, but like just to be able to like get up at like 10.30 at night and just talk to your friends or play video games, it's like a comforting yeah. factor that that's still like a semi-norm you can have in your life. I, I, I'm gonna hold, stay with you for a second. We had the pleasure of meeting your mother uh, backstage and before, who's an amazing, amazing woman. Absolutely. A teacher for a very long time here in Austin. Did that give you any sort of special insight into what being, uh, what it was like being a teacher during the pandemic? Oh, absolutely. Uh, because uh, like I said, we were all working from home at that time. So just like I would be on a Zoom meeting with my professor who is either at campus or at home, she would be at home on the other end teaching her students are going through. And at the same time, she was also trying to run uh, her startup teacher boot camp, where she teaches teachers how to control like their environments while in the classroom, which is difficult when there aren't a lot of people in the classrooms as it is. And so I feel like for her, not only was she struggling like to run a classroom uh, as well as her own business, but also like having to run a family at the same time. And so like obviously, yeah, she gave me insight on what it was like as a professor in these times, especially me knowing like this is probably what my professors are feeling uh, as well but it also showed me like just like my mom is like living her life and trying to do this at the same time these professors are like other human beings who are trying to get by and also teach these students and I think that insight is really important to like know that like everybody is struggling in this time like we've never had to do this in this at this capacity before and so I think it makes it easier to like really grasp the situation. Secretary, you, I mean, you must have so many teachers in your life 
not just professionally, but as friends. I mean, right. you did this for right. such a long time. I mean, what was the, the main takeaway for you? You know, and I'm sure you talked to teachers constantly throughout the pandemic. What was your biggest takeaway? What do you, what do, what do you think teachers need that they weren't getting? Or, or what was your big takeaway about, about being a teacher during the pandemic and what sort of needs teachers really need going forward? Right, right. You know, I remember, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, everybody talks about the broadband access and technology. Teachers were worried about children getting meals. And I know the teachers in the room can attest to this. When your children are suffering, you're suffering. When your students are suffering, you're suffering. When, when they're in need, you're thinking about them. So I recognize the importance of making sure that they're aware of what is happening in the community to meet the basic needs of our students. And you know, that didn't end. Uh, students dealt with loss. Uh, during the pandemic, you know, 140,000 students are returning to our schools uh, having lost a parent or primary caregiver due to COVID. So they're coming into our schools and our teachers are the frontliners who are receiving those students, showering them with love, support, whatever they need. So what, what I know to be true is as we reopen and, and really think about how we're investing in our schools through federal funds, state funds are or any other uh, uh, funds, we need to make sure we're embedding better supports for our educators who, as he so eloquently said, they're dealing with the trauma of their experiences as well, but they're also having to be frontliners for our students. And um, we have to make sure that we're providing them the support, the tool, the time to learn the new tools that are gonna be needed to be more trauma-informed as we reopen our schools. Um, I had a great conversation with Dr. Jackson sitting in the front row. Uh, in Gwinnett County in Georgia. And I was so excited to hear about how that system is embedding a whole new different structure, not only to support students, but to support the educators that support students. That's critical if we're gonna be sustainable with our work. Andrew, I'm gonna come to you now. Um, and then John Mark, because you guys were making this transition from high school to college during this. Did you find that your school had the resources you needed available to you in that moment to sort of make that transition? And, and just, and obviously, this is something you're going through right now, so we'll get to you in a minute, but I'm just curious the, the, the after effect of it. Did you find that your school had the resources that you needed in, in sort of making that transition from high school to college? At first, I'd believe there was no preparation, um, but after a couple of weeks, it got a little better. I mean, we had the integration of Zoom. And it was rough at the start, I won't lie. A lot of teachers didn't know how to share the screen. A lot of teachers didn't really know how to do anything. But it, it was rough on our part, too. We didn't know how to do much. I mean, we're a little bit more technology advanced, but it was still rough on our end. And I think because we didn't really know how to work it, it was hard to like really get the course material out there and really get students engaged with it, especially because I had like this one course that went predominantly online for accounting and it was like such a dense course and to have it online mm -hmm. and not have the instructor be able to like relay the information like she would be able to in person, I didn't really get where I should have been with that course, but I was lucky enough to pass it and to get a good grade in it, but others weren't. And I know that it was because the setup wasn't there for that course at the time. The university wasn't able to provide that yet because it was something that took us all by storm, which is understandable. What about you, John Mark? Uh, for me, uh, when I first started hearing about uh, the pandemic and how it would affect the schools, uh, I, I remember the moment exactly. It was around, uh, around the time when the pandem pandemic started uh, reaching up, uh, and my biology professor, my science professor, was constantly talking about this is what's going on and this is what it's looking like right now. Um, and at the same time, uh, my science teacher in high school was doing the exact same thing. So I could tell on both sides of the spectrum, uh, the schools were identifying that this is something that's going to happen. Uh, and so it feels as though they took that opportunity to then plan for the future. And a good thing about both ACC uh, and the high school I was attending, uh, Reg uh, formerly Reagan, now Northeast Early College High School, uh, is that they're both very technological in terms of how they teach. A lot of the stuff they do is via the internet and through computers and they offer computers to the students who don't have access to those resources. And so just as a pandemic reached up, we just started using those same resources but in a different context and then people started getting access to Zoom 
as well as the school providing like hotspots for any of the students who like didn't have a lot of internet. And then even on a non-technological aspect, uh, like you were saying before about providing meals, uh, I know that uh, me and my mother at some point, not only were going out to get meals uh, for ourselves at the time, but we're also reaching out and trying to provide for others at that time too. So I think uh, that as a community, but specifically uh, in terms of the schools, we were aware that this was most likely gonna be a roadblock in the education system, and we wanted to be as best prepared for it as we could. Giuseppe, you're, you're in the middle of this, right? You're a senior right now, so, so you're getting ready. Uh, are you getting everything you need, you think, from your school to prepare you? I mean, it's a little different now because I know you're back in school, so it's, it's not remote learning right now, but are you, are you getting the sort of everything you need for, the, for that transition? Yes, so at the beginning of the school year, coming back into in-person learning, it was difficult because we didn't have any resources in our college and career center. And so the center was there, but it was empty and the lights were always off. And we have a whole class of seniors who need to fill out their FAFSA and figure out post-secondary options, even if it's not college. Um, and there was no one there to help us. But after some, a few people and I kind of pushed to get someone in there, we... <laughs> um, Student voices being heard, yeah. We now have an incredible person who has helped us, ha helped majority of our class um, finish their FAFSA. Most of our seniors have already been accepted into colleges. Good. And it's just, <laughs> it's just a lot better now that we have some people in there and we have the resources and he's amazing, so. I just want to shout him out. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I, I mean, yeah. as a secretary, I was going yeah, to move to you. I mean, how we, we don't really talk about that, how important it is preparing these kids for, for the future, for careers, for, for college, for university, and all that. I mean, how, how important is that stuff in schools? Yeah. You know, listening to her, I'm glad that a student voice uh, prevailed and that they got things going. Texas received $12 billion with a B. Yes, yes. It needs to touch the classrooms now. <laughs> and I applaud the hardworking educators and the leaders. I know, you know, the challenge during Omicron was keeping the doors open, right? Because I made a joke before, no subs. I, I recognize that. But I want to make sure that as we you know, see now masks off and things are starting to look normal, that we do not lose our sense of urgency around not only the gaps that existed before, but the gaps that were made worse. So we need to really double down. And, um, high, you know, one of the goals that we have at the Department of Education is to kind of improve, dr drastically improve college and career pathways. We need to evolve our high schools much quicker Every student should graduate with options, whether that's joining the workforce, two-year college, four-year college. We need to be better prepared. We need our, listen, we did hybrid last year, most of the country, which meant my children went to school three days a week. The other two days they were learning from home. Let's not abandon that model. But instead of having them go home, go out into the workforce, go learn skills, go do an apprenticeship, get high school credit for it. So. I recognize and I respect the fact that our educators, we're trying to keep our schools open, make sure we're fully staffing them, but full steam ahead with the innovation, we got the funding, let's think outside the box, our students can't wait anymore. Uh, Is there some applause? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but you raise an interesting point, which is, is there anything good we can take out of this? Is there some stuff that we can that we can say, wait a second, you know what? This actually worked. This actually worked, and this actually worked. Let's stick with these. And I mean, what did we what what did we learn from this thing that's good? What can we take from it? Yeah. And I'd love to hear the students on this one, but yeah. you know, the president did say, and from day one, we need to look for the opportunity out of crisis. So when I talk about how Gwinnett County is doing what they're doing, when I hear amazing stories across the country, it's our job to lift it up. Teachers learn best from teachers, we know that. So why, you know, let's lift up those best practices that are happening and let's make sure that as we're lifting up those best practices, we're lifting up practices that include teacher voice, practices that include student voice because they know best 
what they lack and what they need moving forward. And let's, let's put this, Yusena, let's, let's start with you. I mean, let's talk about the positive. Like, what were some things that your school did that were great? And, and was there anything you took out of the experience, as difficult as it was, that's actually helping you and pushing you in a different direction, maybe? Or, is, is there anything good that came out of this that, that you can hold on to and take with you? I think one of the things that my school did pretty well was keeping the students informed. And so throughout the entire pandemic and even up to now, we send weekly letters with information of events that are going on in the school and things that we can all do to help. But also our school provided enough space for students to feel and talk about their emotions as everything was going on. And even now, um, there's counselors in our school who we can talk to, but also our teachers. We form close bonds with them over the years. And even though we didn't realize it, like going back into the schools has definitely shown me the value of those close connections that I have with my teachers. Um, but my school has always done an incredible job with keeping that option open to talk to anyone, really any adult, um, about anything that we might be feeling or any good news that we might share. We all celebrate it there. It's, I just like the community that we've made. And I think just the pandemic has really just made that stronger. Yeah. Okay. Good to hear that. What about you, Audra? On a positive end, I think the school did do some mediation for some students. Um, they saw that we were all going through some stuff and that they, that they implemented like a pass-fail COVID section. So like a lot of colleges would see that it was a COVID pass-fail instead of a regular pass-fail. And that helped out a lot of students, especially those who lost a family and weren't doing so well in classes because they couldn't focus on it. And I think that was a good implementation. I also think the hybrid courses, they're still doing them now, which I think is really great because I remember having a student I mean, up here last semester who was pregnant and she had her daughter and she would be on Zoom and she couldn't, she couldn't come to class, which is completely understandable, but having the hybrid option helped her a lot. In regards to something that I think that I took out of this was that I was able to build stronger connections with my professors. It was easier to drop in and do office hours through Zoom and be able to like connect with them, have an actual relationship where I can like get a recommendation letter for them, especially because I'm going to need it in the future. What about you? Uh, I was going to say more of the same in that a lot of the times uh, with students and teachers or students and professors, the relationship as a dynamic is usually sort of, well, it's supposed to be, you know, human to human. And a lot of the times it can be like teacher to, uh, teacher to student or peer to peer. Uh, and I think that having a good balance of both is important because you want someone who supports you, who's in your corner, but you also want someone who's like not afraid to shy out and say like, this is what you need to do in order to move forward, especially in these times. And I think having a strong figure like that, uh, who's teaching, because I have a lot of teachers uh, who I am like uh, really good with, like relationship wise, and that may be mainly because they've all been friends with my mother at some point. <laughs> but it's also just because they're really good people who have, uh, who have seen what education has been through as a transformation and understand that this is a drastic change from what's going on. And so it's really good to have uh, like a friend who is also willing to help you in the way that a teacher will. Why don't, we, why don't we stick with you? Uh, you know, I'm curious if the last couple of years, did it change your education goals or your career path in any way? I mean, do you feel like before 2020 you, you were thinking about this and on this path and then when everything happened, you realize now you're sort of headed in this direction? I mean, did anything change? Uh, I think things did change, but almost in the opposite polarity. Uh, like I said, I'm studying art and animation, and I'm currently working on piloting my own series right now, which requires like a lot of, <laughs> thank you, which requires being home a lot and like working on scripts and like getting voice actors and planning all that stuff. And so I was always at home doing that. And so then when school sort of kicked up, uh, things like obviously got more busy. And so... I will admit, I can get distracted a lot of times, and so sometimes when I was supposed to be working on an assignment, I'd be like, 
yeah, I should be working on this. This is what your mother's for. This is why she yes, come in and exactly. tell you what to do. And she was really great at keeping me on track, but it's like, oh, I have this important assignment I need to do, Ugh, but the script is almost finished. And so just, uh, and having her to keep me on track was really helpful for that. But I think also just uh, pandemic, like as a whole, I think it was almost sort of like a sign. Cause like as the pandemic started, like I started making a lot of connections, whether at school or like outside of there in different communities that not only were helping me uh, further my education, but also helping with what I was pursuing at the time. And so like I've met a bunch of people who like helped me and were coaching me during my time at school, like at times where like teachers and professors couldn't and like friends I was making through my Zoom classes as well as like people who are now like working on this project with me. And so I think in general, uh, it has been really helpful. And, you know, obviously this whole situation of COVID locking everything down, it's not ideal. We, we weren't expecting this to happen, but the fact that now, like that it's been a while and we're starting to come out of it, like obviously, like I said, things aren't ideal, but we're in stage two now, which is a lot different from when we were in stage five a few weeks ago. And so I think that shows that people are progressing, the environments are progressing, which means that the education system and the schools are progressing at the same rate. And I think that as those transitions continue, it'll make it easier to transition to what was a normal education experience. Okay, very quickly, elevator pitch on your TV show. What's it, what's it called, exactly. what's it about? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you have an audience here, you have an audience. I mean, come on. Uh, my your Instagram handle so you could get some yeah. followers on it too. <laughs> uh, my series is called The Outliers. Uh, it's essentially, uh, a group of bandmates based off of a lot of the friends that I actually made during the pandemic uh, uh, who are just sort of going through a bunch of like efforts to make it as a group. Uh, and so I've got one of my uh, really good friends, Miranda Kitchpanich, who is also like a really good musician uh, uh, who does a lot of stuff online. Uh, and so she's a really talented musician. Uh, so she's working on with me as like a co-director and producer. And one of the important parts about this show to me, <laughs> I wasn't actually planning on talking about this. <laughs> but one of the important parts about this show to me uh, is that it also incorporates music, which is my first love. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I've always been really fond of music. Uh, I play a bunch of instruments. And so having like music as like a core of it because when I was first going to school, which also ties back into the whole pandemic education thing, is when I was first going to school, I was debating whether do I want to major in music or major in art. Uh, and I never like really made that decision until I'm like, this is something I genuinely want to do with my career. This is something I want to pursue. And so what I do is like I learn as much about music as I can on the side and then focus my other efforts on art. Uh, and the art classes that I'm taking uh, are very helpful in that, but also like on a negative turning back to the pandemic is that when you're learning art like through a screen from someone in the classroom, it's like it's not the same as watching a YouTube tutorial on like how to draw something. It's like a professor that's trying to show you something, but maybe their camera isn't working as well or maybe their connection is interrupted. Like I know at least a few times in the past few weeks where my uh, my art professor has like his connection has gone out and we're just like sort of stuck sitting in the Zoom room. And so it's like, it's not an ideal situation, uh, but uh, it's, it's something I have to push through because this is something I'm passionate about and I want to learn. So I'm making the efforts to make, to make those corrections and learn these things. I, I, and you know what? I think art teachers haven't gotten enough attention oh, during this. Like how absolutely. difficult must it be to teach like having art to teach things over like Zoom. art and music? So art teachers, if there are yeah. any out there, very, very important. Art and music. Art, music, career, technical ed, advanced manufacturing. Yep. How do you do that? Um, let's let's head on. So, so I mean, did, did anything? Ch you're you're pre-med, pre-law, right? You're going to go to law school. I mean, did anything change over the last couple of years about your sort of education goals or career path? Well, I would say that education was really affected during COVID, but also was like social justice issues. And so 
before this, I was like, I'm really good. I really want to do malpractice. I really want to do practice because I had like a personal uh, issue with it, with like my family. But like once I was seeing this and I was seeing all the issues that were going on, and it wasn't just with people of color. It was just like yeah. in general. I was like, I I would rather be something that I could help and give back to the community. And so I really want to do like criminal justice or social justice and just stay in that area. So my career path did change, but I think in a positive way. Yeah. Zenny, what about you? Before COVID, I wanted to be a software engineer, um, which would require me to study computer science in college. I cannot do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have learned that I cannot sit and stare at a computer all day. It's a, you wow. know, <laughs> this is a great lesson to learn. I mean, this is you know the upside of COVID for you, yeah. I'm definitely more of a hands-on learner, and so I think that was a big contributing factor to me deciding to major in architectural engineering. Um, but that was my biggest discovery. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. I, I, it's a very good lesson to learn now, and not in <laughs> a year or so. Um, you know, let's talk about college affordability for a minute. I mean. What kind of what kind of factor was 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 cost when deciding on on college right now? I mean, how big of a how big of a, a decision is that? So, throughout high school, I've had to work in order to help my family um, financially, but college is very expensive, and it's only getting more expensive. And so, when I was considering schools, I was mainly focused on Texas schools because they're already in state. I wouldn't have to pay out-of-state tuition, which is even more expensive. Um, but I think I've settled with UT, not settled, settled. <laughs> UT is a good school. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've chosen UT because they provided a very good scholarship and I'm still waiting for my financial aid packet, but it seems like the most affordable school to go to right now. And they also have a great engineering school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Audrey, what about you? Uh, when I was in high school, affordability was like a big decision of mine. And I'm kind of glad that I didn't look at the school that I was originally going to, because when I was in high school, my, I was set on becoming a veterinarian for so long until I had a talk with my veterinarian about like <laughs> her earnings. So I was like, oh. <laughs> but before that, when I was trying to choose a school, I was interested in outside schools yeah. um, of Texas but the pricing was so high that even with scholarships, I was going to pay like 90 grand. Wow. So those were out of my budget. And I'm glad I stayed within Texas just because I, anytime I needed something, my family was, though it's a bit of a drive, they were five hours away from me, which is like better than maybe like a 14 hour drive or a whole flight away, which is gonna, so, and I also have family in San Antonio, so they helped a lot. But, and what about you, John Mark? Uh, for me, uh, I, when I first started out in high school, uh, and I was like, art is what I want to do with my life, I started looking at like popular art schools, and I was like, oh wow, this is a cool one, oh look at this, and then I started seeing stuff like Full Sail and the Art Institute, and uh, I started talking with my mom, and I'm like, hey, this is where I want to go, and then she was like, we don't have money for that. Yeah. And I was like. Listen to your mother, by the way, I've met exactly. her. Yeah. And I was like, uh, what about a college or anything like that? And she's like, we don't have that. We've been having to like make money this whole time. We, we've never had like enough money to set aside for a college fund. And so I'm like, OK. Uh, and so then when I started my senior year, uh, I was a part of an AVID class, which was super lucky for me. Because that AVID class, yeah, there were a bunch of scholarships that like not only were like great, but also were like mandatory to fill out. So like if you, if you were to do one, not only was it good for your grade, but it was also benefiting you for your future, which is kind of the whole point of the class is that uh, it's like a guise to success or you fail. But I mean, it's a good model, <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> but yeah, no, so I found a bunch of really helpful scholarships that uh, got me through ACC, which is why the dual credit program was so important for me. So like, I started out the gate going to ACC, and then after I got through with the scholarships, uh, they set me up with the financial aid package, uh, and I've been going through ever since, and it's super helpful, and every few months they provide me with a package that uh, 
uh, that allows me to like afford any of the materials that I need, um, especially like as an art major, because like brushes like for art are like forty dollars. <laughs> like I had to buy a set of pencils that was like forty, fifty bucks, and so thank goodness that uh, they provide for me. But it's definitely helpful uh, to have like that set up, especially in high school, and that's something I think is super important like not just in early college high schools, but in all high schools to just prepare people to the extent of like, this is how you fill out a scholarship. This is how you do FAFSA. And I was lucky enough to have that as part of early college high school as a part of a dual credit program. But I think that's something we should be like instituting more in like everyday public high schools. Cause that's really important information for people to know, especially people of color who are like, as society is built, like this is a, this is a system that's built with them boxed out and I think it's super important to have to give them that information to combat against the system that's been built. Uh, Secretary, and let's give a round of applause to John Mark. Um, Secretary, it's it's you know college affordability is like it's like the elephant in every room. I mean, uh, you you have a kid. I have a high school kid. I'm looking at colleges. You're yep. doing the same thing. Yep. It's. Insane. It I is. mean, uh, I don't understand how this happened. Like, what's, what do we do? What, what can be done about this? First of all, um, if DeMarco had a podcast, how many of you would listen? Uh, I, uh, all right. Just saying. Yes. Um, the system is broken. The system is broken. I remember having a conversation with a parent of a middle schooler when I was an assistant superintendent in a district. And the parents said, we're not, we're not thinking about the college track because it's just too expensive. The, the kid was like in sixth and seventh grade, bright kid. And it was off the table. How, ma how much talent are we losing in this country? How much talent are we losing because the system is not designed for everyone? So we are taking aggressive steps. It, 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 you know, public service loan forgiveness, 98% denial rate when we walked in, 98%. Um, we just hit the $17 billion mark recently on loan relief, and we're gonna continue to do more. Uh, the system is broken, and we also have to start doing a better job across the country, and we need to lead this charge to make sure we're really measuring return on investment in our higher education institutions. You know. The days of charging you know, $90,000 a year and having graduates leave in jobs that pay $25,000, we need to call that out. We need to call that out. That's why we are pushing so hard to make sure that we have better connections with our high schools and our two-year co two colleges have been, it's really the backbone of our country's growth. And I think we're, we're, they're underutilized. Our state schools are underutilized. So we have to do better, not only really lifting up return on investment, but going after those bad actors that take advantage of our students who are trying to find that American dream, those first gen kids who get taken advantage of. We have to go af after them aggressively. And we have to be serious about loan forgiveness where we're able to do it. We have to be serious about it. And those conversations continue. So we're, we're getting close to the hour mark here. So Jesenia, I'm going to start with you guys. If you switched seats with Secretary Cardona, this is, this is always the final question, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and we're in charge of the Department of Education. What change would you want to make to the education system? One of the biggest things I want to do is change the way we teach, or teachers teach, because it's a lot of textbook-based as I've seen a lot in my ACC classes, and it doesn't encourage kids to think critically. It's more of a like a memorization game <laughs> for a test. Once you memorize the stuff, you do it on the test, you get an A, hopefully, and then you move on. And I can promise you I won't remember half of the stuff I'm learning right now in like five years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe, because I'm gonna be in college, but after that, <laughs> What about you, Audrey? I believe one of my first actions would be to provide, to making sure that there is equality within education across all socio-demographics, especially coming from a school where education wasn't seen um, 
as priority in comparison to working in the oil fields, <laughs> I would say. Right. Um, I would make sure that we provide the same curriculum and make sure that like the teachers are top notch for every student and not have like this imbalance when you go to college and people are performing better than others because they were able to have those resources provided to them, as well as making test prep um, affordable and or even given for free to students who need it for like the ACT or the SAT, something that's going to determine your future. Having to pay for those books or having to ta pay for that test prep has deterred a lot of students from getting a good score. Mm. And I think making an implementation to like give students those resources might affect their career path drastically. Now Mark? Yeah, just once again, uh, just providing, or having a providable education uh, for people of color and like minority groups, because like we said, the system is broken. And the way the system is built, it's sort of, it's built to educate people of like certain class rates, but not the same that they do of people of a higher class. And to so provide an equal education for people so that they have equal opportunities so that society isn't shutting them out, I think is really important. Uh, you gotta watch your back, Secretary. You got, hey. you got, you got three people here who might be taking your Listen, jobs. Listen, maybe we need to make an office for them at the department. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, you, Secretary, I'm gonna give you the last word here. Is there anything that you wanna say to the audience or, or to these really brilliant oh, man. kids? I get inspired when I hear students and I think what we need to do is, you know, we, students always had voice, we're just, our systems are not always designed to listen. Um, and I agree with everything that they're saying. You know, I, st I talked about achievement disparities as a, a catalyst for me to want to get into education. So whether it's providing uh, support or Pell Grants for our dreamers who also should have an opportunity to follow their... <laughs> or making sure that students are at the table when we're talking about school improvement plans so that we could talk about pedagogy. <laughs> or being honest about how our data reflects significant gaps in our country in 2022, and we have an opportunity now to rebuild, um, addressing those boldly and unapologetically. I, I, their voice needs to be at the table. Um, and, to, and to the folks in the room, you know, we've gone through a lot together. This has been a rough two years, um, but one thing that I, I do know is that um, the best days in education are ahead of us. Let's not let our urgency dissipate. Let's not return to the conventions that led us to the system where we had uh, haves and have nots. You know, let's disrupt education together. Let's do it together. I spent over 20 years in my education career pointing fingers and saying the system is broken, the system is broken. This, well now I represent the system. <laughs> so it's on me and I take this job very seriously as a father, as an educator, as a Latino, to do as much as I can do now so that generations later don't have to deal with some of the issues we have. We have more money in education than we ever had before. We're able to reset like we had never had before. Do we have the will to come together and fight for and defend our students, especially the vulnerable ones that are getting attacked across the country? Do we have the will to come together and improve education? I say yes, I know they say yes, they're worth it, they suffered enough. Let's come together and lift and raise the bar. Let's Level up education. Um, let's also have a round of applause. Uh, Jesenia, Audra, John Mark, and it's really great. Thank you guys so much. And the secretary. Thank you so much, secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck on your test. <laughs> Thank you all.